Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this VPH summer school. It's the second time we organize this. I'm Bart Benens, working here in the UPF. We organized this together with Jérôme Noy and uh, Mathieu de Cana from Philips because it's a collaboration with a European research project, Cardio Function, that we do this. Now, as you've seen from the program, what we try to do is try to bring you some information on the use of VPH technologies, VPH approaches, this year's in kind of vascular uh, kind of approaches and fluid dynamics and things like that. And what we think is quite important is that since VPH is intrinsically so interdisciplinary, also when we start to do research, when we try to explain some of these things, we have to try to cover many of these aspects. And that means that before you can do any modeling or any analysis, you have to understand what it's going about. And that's why today we will start with some aspects of the basic pathophysiology behind everything that's related to flows and vessels in the body. And you will see in the next days we will gradually build this up by starting to talk a little bit about acquisition of data because without any data you cannot do any modeling. Next we will talk a little bit about the models themselves at organ levels, at cell levels, cell levels and these kind of things. And not to forget also the technology behind it, because there's a lot of computational problems, implementation problems. That's what we will cover more on Thursday. And then we will end up by looking at an overview application where we try to combine everything. You will see we will get a little bit more information later on. In the afternoon, we do hands-on sessions, which are related to this. We will do the explanation just after lunch, and so you can see which one you can participate. But today we're going to start first with talking about the really the basic aspects, the biology, the pathophysiology behind it. And it's my pleasure to invite the first speaker, Gemma Villahour. She is like from training a veterinarian. So you see already how very interdisciplinary this will be. And we want to talk about the basic pathophysiology of atherosclerosis and vascular remodeling. Because when you start to talk about flows in the body, this is one of the basic things. And Gemma is working here in Barcelona in the Institute for Cardiovascular Sciences, which is quite an important institute doing a lot of research on thrombosis, for example, and other things. So welcome, and we're looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed for such a nice introduction. And um, for me, it's a real pleasure being here and contributing to this course. So I want to be deeply thank the organizers and coordinators for giving me the chance to just uh, introduce yourselves in the cardiovascular field from a basic point of view. So uh, we'll go through, we'll start with atherosclerosis, its impact in vascular remodeling, and then move towards the clinical events, which is thrombosis. So the, um, wait a second, where should I point? Um, either, oh, perhaps there, no, perhaps there, <laughs> here. I'm not pressing the right button. <laughs> now, thank you. Thank you so much. So let's just start by the most important. What, what, when we're talking about cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis, what are we talking about? And to understand this, we have to talk about numbers. We have to talk that it's the leading cause of death worldwide. In 2012, the World Heart Organization said that 31% of the causes of death were related to cardiovascular disease. And if we take a closer look to Europe, we can see that here is in, in, in red, here are all these um, triangles, that in both men and women, it's almost 50% of the causes of death. Indeed, it's a bit higher in women than men, and there are not only differences across genders, but also around Europe. So you can see the incidence of cardiovascular disease is much higher in the Eastern Europe as compared to the Western Europe. And what about Spain, since we're here today? Though it has become a worrisome problem because uh, it has increased during the last three years, 6%, the incidence of death for cardiovascular disease. So we're really talking about a disease that we have to invest on and keep on working. And what is the main underlying cause of cardiovascular disease is atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis has reached epidemic proportions. However, it again has a, a different distribution of around the countries. So if there are all these um, countries which are more developed and you know, where a, a lifestyle where fast food, tobacco is present, cardiovascular risk factors, 
And the incidence of atherosclerosis is much, much higher than those countries that are still in the development. And when we talk about atherosclerosis, we are talking about, it's very important to have in mind that we're talking about a chronic disease. So it really develops over decades. And it's related to both components, two important components. One, the inflammatory mediated, another one is a lipid driven uh, process. So you can see here, lipids will go in detail further on, but lipids get into the vessel wall which induces that the lumen of the artery gets narrower, so that influences the blood flow. And the formation of this atherosclerotic plaque, which is lipid rich, may eventually break and expose um, substrates that are not usually exposed to the flow in blood, inducing the appearance of thrombus formation and the clinical presentation of the disease. Uh, so depending on where this occurs, we can talk about ischemic heart disease, sudden death, myocardial infarction, and so on. We can talk about cerebrovascular disease in which strokes the main participant here. It happens in the carotid arteries. It can happen in the cerebral arteries. And also, when it happens distally, we're talking about peripheral artery disease. There are the three, three different manifestations that both of them emerge and compose what's called the cardiovascular disease. So just, uh, it's important to have in mind how is the vascular structure, and these are basic concepts. It's composed of three layers, the intima, the media, and the dentitia. The intima, the first one, it's composed of the endothelium, which is this monolayer of cells which are in contact with the lumen, with the vessel lumen. And these are recovered by an internal elastic laminae. The second one, the media, is the most thick one, and it's composed of vascular smooth muscle cells, which are exposed uh, concentrically one to each other, and it's also recovered by this elastic uh, external, in this case, elastic lamina. And finally, the third layer, the most exterior one, is the adventitia. The adventitia, as you can see here, is mainly formed by extracellular matrix components, cholesterol, collagen, and all that. But most important is the only one that has vessels. And this is important bec because the vessel has to be nourished somehow, and in healthy conditions, vessels are only present in the adventitia, and they are called the vasa vasorum. Uh, this, is, this is a diagram in which it illustrates here the endothelium layer and the, here on the inter uh, internal elastic lamina. So this is the intima. And what happens uh, with this layer that is in direct contact with the blood and the healthy conditions? First, it has antiplatelet properties. The first property is that this is surface is negatively charged. And platelets present a uh, phospholipid layer, which is also neg negatively charged. So in the healthy conditions, there is a repulsion effect, and they don't interact. In second term, this endothelial layer also express proteins, which are called ectodPase. And what they do is that through a conversion process of conversion, they convert ATP in adenosine, and adenosine is known to inhibit platelet aggregation. Sorry, third. Most importantly, it releases these two compounds, prostacycline and nitric oxide. And I say this importantly because they are the main uh, components involved in inhibiting platelet reactivity. And if these two the compounds are not synthesized, there is a tendency to throw us a thrombotic risk. So in the, in the healthy conditions, this endothelium exerts antiplatelet properties. But not only antiplatelet properties, it also expresses in its surface proteins that are, are in charge of blocking the activation of a coagulation cascade. But even in the case that some coagulation occurs, the endothelium also is an important source of tissue plasminogen activator, which is in charge of dissolving the form coagulation or forming clot. So the health endothelium exerts antiplatelet, anticoagulant, and fibrinolytic properties, and therefore prevents thrombosis to occur. However, what happens under the presence of this chronic disease in which you are continuously exposed to cardiovascular risk factors that the endothelium is damaged and all these properties disappear. And when we're talking about cardiovascular risk factors, we are talking about some factors that cannot be modified. Uh, they are like they are, dependent, age, gender, ethnicity, and genetics. But there are many others of them that we can modify then and we can't uh, work on them. You can see here blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, sedentarism, glucose, tobacco, all that can be modified. And I would like to strengthen this point because most of them are just depending on the lifestyle we, we carry. So if we, we follow um, high fat, sugar rich diet, all these cardiovascular risk factors get increased. But if you follow the Mediterranean lifestyle, which is the Mediterranean diet, you can moderate all these cardiovascular risk factors just lessen the risk to develop atherosclerosis. 
I wanted to especially point out the cholesterol because everybody has the concept that high cholesterol is bad. But it's not always like that because cholesterol is, is the sum of two components of the cholesterol. The HDL cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol, it's called high-density lipoprotein cholesterol, and there is a bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol. So it's called the low-density lipoprotein cholesterol. And when they give you your cholesterol is 300, it comes from the sum of both of them. So perhaps this number results from because there is an increase on the good one. And what does the good one do? Well, the bad one just de de deposits in the vessel and forms the atherosclerotic plaque. The good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, what it does is that remove this cholesterol from the vessels, take it to the liver to get secreted. So this is very important to take in mind that the worst scenario is to have a, a high LDL cholesterol, but never HDL cholesterol. So I said this because this is an important play in the atherosclerotic plaque. To just give a brief overview of how, how the atherosclerotic uh, process takes place. We see here that the chronic exposure to tobacco infections, uh, changes in shear stress, what it does is that damages this endothelial layer. And since it damages, all these LDL particles that are present in the bloodstream can enter easily into the intima. Once they enter, the problem is that they get in contact with these cellular matrix components and they suffer minim minimal modifications firstly, and afterwards, once they're retained, get oxidized. And this is, the, this is dangerous and injurious also because it induces the endothelium to secrete chemotactin substances in order to recruit inflammatory cells, just a protective mechanism. Inflammatory cells have to get into the vessel and engulf all these lipids and just disappear. So atherosclerosis in, in, in its early stages is a protective response against the accumulation of LDLs within the vessel. But what happens if you keep LDL cholesterol high and you keep having bad cholesterol levels. What it happens then is that all this system of engulfing um, per, per the back monocytes have entered, have transformed into macrophage, and they engulf all the lipids, but this gets overwhelmed. And so the, lip, the macrophage is not macrophage anymore, and it becomes a foam cell, which is a cell that's very rich in lipids and loses all cell function and eventually dies. And when it dies, not only it releases uh, growing factors that induce the migration of these smooth muscle cells that were in the intima, and they, they change their phenotype towards a contractile phenotype, to a synthetic phenotype in which they release proteolytic enzymes, they release collagen and so forth, but also then to migrate into the lesion, and so the lesion starts growing. The lesion starts growing, vascular muscle, muscle cells go there at the beginning, they synthesize collagen, but they also release proteolytic enzymes that break down all the matrix components, and lipids get deposited because all the cell dies and release the cholesterol crystals over there. So over time what happens is that you have here a protrusion in which there has been an atherosclerotic plaque development. In, in our group, we demonstrated that not only these macrophages are capable of engulfing this lipid and becoming foam cells, but also vascular smooth muscle cells. And we see here the vascular smooth muscle cells, uh, they have accumulation of lipids. And, it, and we also explained that these mechanisms by, by which vascular smooth muscle cells engulf these lipids, it's via a receptor called LLP1. So not only the inflammatory cells get lipid rich, but also the vascular smooth muscle cells. So this is an example of two very nice images to human coronary arteries. Here we have an initial lesion in which is, is rich in vascular smooth muscle cells. They have started migrating. Since they have migrated and they have changed their phenotype, they synthesize collagen. And still lipid, the lipid core is not that rich because cells have not died and have not released all the lipid content. And also inflammatory cells are starting to come as a protective mechanism, but have not seen how dangerous it's going to get the, the lesion itself. But over time, in advanced lesion, what happens is that these vascular smooth muscle cells have get too much rich in lipids, and they have lost their function, and they have died. So vascular smooth muscle cells disappear, therefore their synthesis of collagen disappears, and there is an enrichment, every time re more richer and richer, of this lipid core, rich in cholesterol crystals, and in more inflammatory cells that go to the lesion. So this is the main features of an uh, ath vulnerable atherosclerotic plaque. As you can see here, we can see some foam cells here li rich in lipids. Most of them have already died and have released all the cholesterol crystals. We see only few vascular smooth muscle cells. And mainly all the inflammatory cells are recruited in what's called the shoulder of the lesion. 
that's the region that's more prone to rupture and the, the region in which thrombus formation majorly occurs. Another characteristic, as I told you uh, before, is that as you can see here that the adventitia here in this brownish is rich in vasa massorum to nourish all the, all the cellular layers, all the vascular layers, sorry. But as this layer becomes thicker, there is a need to provide more nutrients, there is a need to the vessels to grow. However, the growth of the vessels under these conditions in which there is inflammatory milieu only leads to the formation of leaky vessels, immature vessels, that they end up doing hemorrhages. And hemorrhages is another feature which makes plaques more vulnerable to rupture. So this is a representative image, and we can see a healthy vessel in which, in the vas of sorum here, you can see it very nicely in that dentition, there is no vessels in the intima of the media. However, in advanced atherosclerotic lesions, you only not only see the vessels here, vas of sorum and dentition, but you can see many vessels entering the media, and even some of them are hemorrhagic down here. And this is what makes the lesions prone to rupture. So, but does atherosclerosis occur in all the vascular tree? And the answer is no. It mainly occurs where there is a turbulence of the flow. If flow follows, a la it has been demonstrated that where in the zones where flow, fo flow follows a laminar pattern, endothelial cells are functional, do not change their gene expression, and you know, everything's physiological. However, it has been demonstrated also in counterpart that in the branches, what happens is that there is a, a turbulence of the flow which induces these endothelial cells to change their pattern of gene expression and also to become dysfunctional. And this is very important because then they give rise to the possibility of enter the lipids and form here, as you can see, all the deposits of atherosclerotic plaque. So it usually occurs in zones where there are branches and bifurcation and where the flow has lost its laminar pattern. So I wanted to, to give a hint of, because when you talk about changes in flow, you usually talk about changes in share rate. And what share rate? Um, Blood flow goes on different layers, and we can, as they, as they advance in different layers, and shear rate could be considered the rate of the different velocities between the different layers of the blood. So it could be considered the difference between all the layers. And blood flow fo follows a, 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 here you can see a parabolic pattern. And shear rate so depends on what? In the blow velocity, the first, and also in the diameter of the channel. And this is very important because uh, as much you increase the blood velocity, or as much you decrease the diameter, that means there is an estenosis and blood has to go quicker through a narrower place, share rate increases. And what is an, what's the impact of that? The impact is that erythrocytes get deformed. So they, they keep, they, and they get, um, they migrate towards the axis of the vessel just because of their size. And what does this induce is that platelets get displaced towards the endothelial layer. And this facilitates the interaction between the endothelial layer and platelets. And this is very important to have in mind when we're talking about shear rates and the impact that shear rate may have in the formation of thrombus. So when we're talking about um, a shear rate in the physiological conditions, we'll be talking about 112 seconds minus one. And this occurs in those vessels that are healthy or patent, or also in those vessels that have been stented. A stent has been placed just to open the artery, and so here it, the vessel recovers its diameter. When we talk about the share rate of around 800, we're talking those vessels in which, arterial vessels in which it has very moderate estenotic lesion. There's a still some flow, but you can see here this starting estenotic procedure of the vessel. And finally, the most dangerous one, the most representative of those culprits for the clinical event, are the high severe stenotic or high share rates. We're talking about 1730 for 100 seconds minus one. And this occurs really when there is almost no space for the blood to occur, and they usually end up uh, rupturing the plaque and forming a thrombi, which occludes all and presenting uh, the clinical event. So um, now let's talk about the association or the link between share rate and vascular remodeling. Because um, the fact that we'll see here, we see here the ataroma, and the first of all, what happens is that uh, when share rate increases, the endothelial uh, layer just receives a message that the lumen is narrowing, I have to do, um, uh, I have to um, compensate for this error, so I have to expand outward as a response, as a healthy response. So the first response is what's called the, the incomplete outward or the outward perfect outward in which you do not lose the lumen size. 
However, then there is some situations, especially has been detected in smokers, and it's not no, the reasons still not known, that the, the, the endothelium is not capable to activate this compensatory mechanism. And what happens then is the vasculature does not respond, and the atherosclerotic plaque grows inward, as you can see here. And you keep losing you, you, your lumen. However, it's important to have in mind that having outward or inward modeling does not determine the clinical event. In other words, you can have this inward remodeling and have, have a, pre a presence of angina, stable angina, in which the plaque is stable. There has been no rupture and there's no clinical event. Just the flow is low and you have chest pain. And you may have this situation here, it has been an outward remodeling, so the lumen was not affected at all. But the plaque was soft and the plaque ruptured and induced the protrusion of this thrombi and the consequent appearance of thrombotic event, as you can see here. So there are many questions that remain here in this field. So it's which of the mechanisms leads to inward or outward modeling. But nevertheless, the most important is whatever what happens in the vessel, you cannot predict the clinical event. Uh, I wanted to put these images because I think they're very representative. So which are the culprit lesions for the culprit events? Here, you can, as I told you, this is a stable angina. You have a very low flow. You have chest pain. That's all. But what happens if this uh, plaque just erodes, as you can see here, and it exposes just a little piece of the inner layers, which are thrombogenic, and induces thrombi that do not get firmly attached, and they embolize. They appear, they embolize, they appear, they embolize. So you have chest pain episodes, and that's what's called a stable angina, in which sometimes you have a relief, sometimes you have pain. The worst is scenarios come here. These Two scenarios are what's called acute coronary syndrome. And what happens is that here the plaque, fissures of ruptures, and there is a thrombi. And when this thrombi just partially occludes the lumen, so there is still flow going through, you talk about an acute coronary syndrome with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. I don't know if you've heard about non-STEMI or STEMI patients. In the, other, in the other case, when you have a thrombi that has completely occluded the artery, and there is no way that blood grows through the distal organ. We're talking about STEMI situation, ST elevation myocardial infarction. And this is important because when a patient arrives to, to the um, emergency department, you first do an AKG. And you, you, see, you read the pattern. This is an electrocardiogram. This is a bit of a heart. And here it's uh, divided in different um, waves. And the thing is that this wave here this, that's depressed is the ST wave. So if it's depressed, you get this non-ST because it's not elevated. But here, when it's up, you really know that he's having a complete coronary occlusion and you have to go rapidly to the PCI department to place an stent. So these are the clinical events that may take place. So, um, and does the plaque have to rupture or with erosion, that's enough? Uh, it must be said that 70-80% of the cases in which thrombi have been detected in the coronary artery post-mortem have been because the, the rupture, there has been the rupture of the atherosclerotic plaque. However, only, although only 20 or 30% of the cases there has been plaque erosion, the most interestingly is that among this 20-30%, 80% do fa fatal events. So although erosion is much, much likely less, as much less likely to happen. Uh, the thing is, when it happens, it's more severe. And this happens particularly in women. Here I wanted to, I ah, know, a video which is not work, it's a bit deep. Um, the thing is that this is an atherosclerotic plaque, and when it gets ruptured, it exposes all this material that, that then uh, just facilitates the platelet to adhere. I will try. thing is that when we and wanted to put this video because it was the link between the atherosclerotic lesions and the main culprit of the thrombotic events, which, is, which are the platelets. So you can see here, it doesn't matter if we're talking of a partial or total occlusion of non stemming STEMI, but all ultimately when you go and you zoom in, you can see that the last player is the platelet. When we're talking about platelet, we're talking about a blood cell that it's synthesized from the bone marrow and it has a very short half-life only seven to 10 days. And you know why? Because it doesn't have a nucleus. And since it doesn't have a nucleus, that's it, it just inside and then dies. 
And the thing is that if you take a look, a look at the electron microscopy studies, you can see here that its structure is that it's plenty of granules. And this is really important because the granules what are released from all, the, all these platelets not only uh, mm, condition how big will be the thrombi, but also um, if there will be other responses, which is inflammatory reactions and so forth, as we can see in the next slide. Look, I wanted to put this slide because take into account that platelets only represent 1% of the components in plasma. Only 1% and can do all that. So you, you do, do have to take them into account. And look at the size, it's four times, five times as smaller than the erythrocytes. And when they get activated, look, they release all this amount of components from the granules. They have dense granules in which they release ATP, ADP. We'll see all these are just um, challengers of platelet activation. They release other, gran uh, other agonists such as serotonin and histamine. And look, alpha granules, all these chemokines, growth factors, fibrinolytic, coagulation factors. So when a platelet gets activated and release all its granules, it not, not only will condition the thrombotic response, but also will condition the growth of the atherosclerotic plaque and the inflammatory reaction that will take place at the site of rupture. And it also releases in the last years has been taken into account microRNAs. And microRNAs are RNAs that cannot be, have not been encoded to become proteins, but they can modulate other RNAs, and so they modulate gene expression. So platelets, as you can see here, when they get activated, they change their shape and they express or protrude lamellipodia, which uh, allow them to get attached to the vessel and also get it at attached to the platelets. As we can see here, when they get activated again, not only they contribute to hemostasis and thrombosis, but also to inflammation and atherogenic processes. This is, uh, this is the platelet, and I wanted to highlight that it's full of receptors. It serves plenty of receptors. Some receptors are involved in allowing its attachment to the vessel wall. As you can see here, we can have all these glycoproteins because mainly the receptors are rich in glucose. So that's why they're called glycoproteins. And what they do is that most of them interact with all the components of the extracellular matrix. Because when, when the, the, the vessel erodes or ruptures, it exposes components of the inner vessels, mostly extracellular matrix components, elastic, laminae, which express all this uh, compounds over here. And which, thanks to the platelet that express all the receptors, they can accordingly interact with each other and prevent what? And prevent bleeding. So I wanted to put this slide because this is really important to have in mind. There is a huge difference between hemostasis and thrombosis. Because hemostasis is, is the human response just to stop bleeding. If you cut yourself, you cut your finger, you stop bleeding in 20 seconds, hopefully. And this is because platelets have recognized through all these receptors, um, um, substrates, collagens, which are in the inner uh, layers of the vessel, and they just get attached and stop hemorrhage. But that's not the case. This is a physiological response in order to stop hemorrhage. But this is not the case in thrombosis. Thrombosis is there, it has been a culprit that's not a cut that has induced thrombus to occur. So there is a, a pathological condition that stimulates thrombus formation. And it, platelets go there not to stop bleeding, just because they recognize surfaces that are foreigners for them. And so usually that's pathological, it's always pathological, and we are talking about clinical presentations. So hemostasis is physiological, thrombosis is pathological, and in both, platelets and coagulation come at play. So both are important. So uh, here are the platelets. I wanted to, this is a diagram in which what the first um, step that occurs during platelet adhesion to the vessel wall is through von Willebrand factor. Von Willebrand factor is a protein that's circulating in, in, the, in the blood regularly, but when it detects a surface that is not the endothelium, it gets avidly attached to collagen. And the collagen attached to the von Willebrand factor it's very appealing for the glycoproteins of the platelets to get attached to. So here's the first point in which platelets get anchored to the vessel, but this is a very weak attachment. So this with just flow, platelet would go away. So there have to be other interactions in which other, uh, other components or other platelet receptors then, when, when this one has occurred, they get attached to different components. 
and this is forms then a more tight attach of the platelet to the vessel wall. And this activates what's called an outside-in signaling towards a platelet activation state. And as I told you, when platelets get activated, several things happen. First, they change their shape and they start expressing lamidipodia. Second, they release their granule secretion, all the granule content, as you can remember, as you may recall, there were multiple agonists, ADP, serotonin, capable of challenging platelets to activate. So all these factors that are released interact with the surface uh, of the platelet nearby, stimulating their activation. But in addition, because the rupture, um, here the plaque has rupture, this has induced the hyomolysis of multiple red blood cells. And red blood cells are a very important uh, source, a very rich source of ADP. So there is a huge amount of release of ADP, which is attached to the platelet receptor and, again, further enhances the platelet activation process. But what's the third thing that occurs, which is very important, is that there is an enzyme cause call, called phospholipase, which is in the surface of the platelet, that gets activated. And what it does is that gets this acid, from, uh, fatty acid, from the membrane, which is arachidonic acid, and converts it to thromboxane, which is a potent inducer of platelet activation. And I wanted to highlight this because there are differences, differences, strengths of agonists that can induce platelet agonization. And although large amounts uh, of ADP are released, it, this is considered a weak platelet agonist. And as you go down the line here, you can see that thromboxane is more powerful. And finally, the most powerful one is thrombin. And they say finally because thrombin is the, uh, is, the end is the end product of the coagulation gasket and we can will come further on. So because of the importance of all these um, receptors in platelets and interacting with different agonists in activating platelets, uh, the last event what occurs is that there is a conformational change in the receptor over here which is called the glycoprotein 2B3A receptor. I'm specifying its name because it's really important. When platelets get activated, they induce a conformational change of this uh, receptor from a closed form to an open form. And when it gets open, the receptor, it allows the, the, the attachment of fibrinogen of on factor, both of which are regular in the circulation. And what happens when fibrinogen gets attacked? That's rapidly looking for another glycoprotein to B3A. So if the platelet nearby is also activated, it favors platelets to get interacted and form what's called the platelet aggregates. And when platelets are aggregates, they are then firmly stuck to the vessel and it's very different to get dislodged. So because of the, because of the importance of these receptors, all the armamentarium nowadays in the clinical arena have focused on blocking all these pathways. And just for, for curiosity, um, as I told you later, uh, when arachidonic gets activated, it forms thromboxane, which is a potent antagonist. And here, when aspirin comes at play, it just blocks this pathway and prevents platelet activation to occur. But despi despite the usefulness and the success of plate, uh, aspirin, there are still 20% of events that occur being on aspirin. And that's why there are many other platelet uh, activation pathways that need to be uh, blocked. So we can be find the FDA inhibitors, thromboxane, part that blocks from being ADPs and 2B3As. The most uh, widely used in the clinical arena, as you can see here, the other ones are aspirin, of course, obviously, and then these blockers of ADP and blockers of 2B3A. Because why? Because ADP is released in large amounts, so let's try to block the receptors. Although a weak receptor, we have a lot, a lot of ADP going around the site of rupture. And why the 2B3A inhibitor? Because it's the last step if you prevent platelets from attach one to another, they will never aggregate and they will never form a thrombi. And why do not block all, all the platelet receptors at the same time? Because then you have the risk of bleeding and you have to find the sweet point in which you prevent thrombosis. But in case there is this physiological hemostasis, this can take place. And when um, you have been combining thrombin inhibitors, PAV inhibitors with ADPs, what has happened? Okay, the person does not have any event because of thrombosis, but it dies because of hemorrhage. So this is why you have, when you use the combination, you have to use the right combination to still have on top uh, working hemostasis. So this is just a brief summary of what has been presented here. What happens is the, the surface of the plaque at the road of the rupture allows 
attachment of von Willemann factor, which the first initial step of adhesion of the platelets, this, the platelet gets further firmly adhered, it gets activated, it changes the shape, it releases all the granule contents and activates arachidonic acid to form thromboxan, and finally, it changes the conformational change of the 2B3A, allowing platelet platelet interaction and thrombi formation. Platelets also within the granules, you can see that you have seen that they have inflammatory mediators. And this is really important because then that recruit is inflammatory, inflammatory cells to the growing thrombi. So the thrombi not only has platelet and inflammatory and red blood cells that have been entrapped, but also inflammatory mediators. But so far we have talked about one of the components in thrombosis, which are platelets. But there are two components of thrombosis, which is the coagulation cascade. Because despite platelets get aggregated, they, kept, they have to get firmly uh, attached one to another in, in, a, in a net of fibrin, which it surrounds the thrombi and allows it to do not dissolute. And here's where the coagulation cascade comes at play. The coagulation cascade is a, is a process, coagulation factors are cymogens, that means that are proteins that are inactive in blood and they circulate in the regular conditions. But when either one or the other pathway thrombotic uh, of the coagulation cascade get activated, what happens is that these this cymogens get cleaved and they get activated. And there is a cascade, and one activates the other, and activates the other. So it's then you end up having thrombin here, and finally, which converts fibrin into fibrin. No, uh, so first we have the extrinsic pathway in which the most important component is tissue factor. Tissue factor is present in all these lipid-rich foam cells. I talked to you about monocytes that have been engulfing the lipids, vascular smooth muscle cells that have been capt uh, capturing the lipids. And in addition to the lipids, all these lipids, what induce to the cells is to express tissue factor. And this is very dangerous because when there's the rupture of the plaque, this tissue factor gets exposed and triggers the extrinsic coagulation path path um, pathway. This, there is another pathway which is called the intrinsic pathway or the contact pathway in which the, the, the activation of platelets and the breakdown of several cells release negatively charged particles and these negatively charged particles are capable of activating factor 11 in factor 11a. But nevertheless, if there is a breakdown of the atherosclerotic plaque with exposure of tissue factor which is able to cleave factor 7 in factor 7a, this, this, this complex can also activate, as you can see here, the intrinsic pathway, and start cleaving all the factors one to another, one to another, until eventually the formation of thrombin. You remember I told you it was a very potent platelet agonist. But thrombin not only activates platelets, but converts the fibrinogen that is synthesized in the liver, and it converts it to fibrin, forming this fibrin mesh, as you can see here. But I want to draw your attention to factor 8a and factor 5, which are key steps in the coagulation cascade. Because factor A, it just allows the conversion, or the, or the, where, where both converge, both uh, coagulation pathways converge in the activation of 10A, which is very important. And also factor 5, because it allows the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. And why did I want to pay the, draw your attention to these two? Because these two only get activated in the surface of activated platelets. In other words, if platelets do not get activated, this, this coagulation pathway does not occur. And when platelets get activated, what it happens is that they change their phospholipid bilayer, so they're exposed in their uh, external surface negatively charged um, ions which attract the factor 5 and factor 8 to get adhered. So there is a retroatherosclerotic plaque, tissue factor is released and activates the extrinsic pathway. And then all the coagulation pathway takes place, thank you, that platelets have been activated and have exposed the ability to get a factor 5 and factor A attached. So wh what, if, what is first? Is it coagulation or is it activation of the coagulation cascade? So several studies have been trying to just find out wh which comes first. And the thing is that we, we performed several studies with perfusion chamber differential rate with the use of a human coronary substrates. And we, what we did see is that first, when you, when you trigger a thrombus, first what you see is fibrin here in red. That is the resultant of the coagulation cascade. And afterwards, on top of fibrin, platelets start to get adhered. But it's not that coagulation first takes place, but takes place more rapidly. So when the coagulation cascade gets activated rapidly, thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin. 
Meanwhile, platelets have get slightly adhered, tightly adhered, activated and aggregated. So that, that's why the reason why fibrin gets firstly deposited in the vessels. So because of the, the, the important role of, of, of this factor eight and factor five here, the conversion, there have been many drugs that have tried to stop the coagulation cascade. And most of them have focused mainly in two factors. One is factor 10, because if you block factor 10, you block the conversion of the two extrinsic and intrinsic pathway, is the conversion point. And another one is, is factor two, or thrombin, because once you stop thrombin uh, formation to occur, not only you inhibit platelets, but also you prevent fiber information. And nowadays there is a fight against what should we do? Should we block factor 10 or should we to block factor two? So, but uh, in, in parallel to the coagulation cascade, there is also running what's called a fiber analytic system. Because as I told you later, uh, later on, the, the, in the in physiological conditions, endothelium is in charge of, of releasing tissue plasminogen activator here, which just uh, converts the plasminogen that has been released to the liver to plasmin, and plasmin has very, very high affinity to fi fibrin polymers. So although the fibrin has already, the fibrin network has formed, if there is a healthy endothelium, there is no problem because we'll have plasmin, and plasmin will break down all the polymers of fibrin and then have the different dimers here. So that's why in the physiological conditions, hemostasis, you make a cut, it stops bleeding, and then you have no more issues because the fibrinolytic system has, has come to play. Fantastic. But what happens in the thrombosis? And the thrombosis, there is a huge increase in the release of one inhibitor, which is called PI, plasminogen activated inhibitor. That what it does is that prevents the formation of plasminogen to plasmin. So if there is no plasmin, there is no breakdown. In case there is some plasmin, when you have an acute event, what also rapidly rises in the blood is alpha-2 antiplasmin. So just in case some plasmin has been formed, there is a rise, a tremendous rise in this protein, which blocks definitely uh, the, the breakdown of polymers of fibrin. So you can see here that um, the, the vulnerable plaque not only is rich in tissue factor, which induces the coagulation cascade, but also is very rich in this inhibitor on the fibrinolytic system. So if you have thrombosis, if you have platelet activation, you have coagulation, and you have impaired fibrinolytic system, that's what's happening here. You have the formation of this thrombi, which is rich in, in red platelets, in fibrin, that recovers all the measure of platelets. And because this fibrin uh, does not allow cells to pass through, red blood cells have get attached, and also inflammatory cells have get attached. And if this occurs in the coronary artery here, you have an acute coronary event. So just to end on my talk, I would like to, to, to give a hint. And when you, when you take into account, I'm going to um, model a vessel and see what happens in thrombosis and coagulation because it has had acute event or I want to model patients and antiplatelet treatment. There is another factor that you have to have surely in mind, which is the presence of comorbidities. In other words, if this patient is obese, if this patient has diabetes, and if this patient has hypertension, and this is because all these conditions per se, independently of the presence of acute coronary event, worsen the progression of, of the thrombotic process. And I wanted to draw special attention to one that has been lately most that has had a pandemia in the last 30 years, and which is quite perfectly now, I would say, all the mechanisms that drive an increased thrombus formation because diabetes, there's still and a no relation between having high glucose levels and the risk of thrombosis. But it's definitely sure that when you are obese, your risk of thrombosis is increased and your fibrinolytic system is impaired. We're talking about a disease, look at, look at these numbers here, that not only is present in the United States with 46% of total population, but just the south of Europe, these numbers are really alarming. So we just really t should take into consideration that the likelihood that you have to perform in a study of an obese patient is really high, it's 40%. So um, what do you understand by obesity? And this is a term that needs to be clarified. When we talk about obesity you regularly, uh, you, we talk about body mass index. This is the, uh, the best known among peers, uh, the, the term. And when we have BMI of about 25, you're overweight. If it's above 30, you have obesity type 1, and so on, obesity type 2 and type 3. So this is the most part of the population now within here, 
ob overweight obesity class one. But sometimes this, this may lead to, to a mistake or to me a misleading perception because you just have a very high body mass index because you are all muscle. So uh, you must have a body mass index of 29 it's just because you are so fit to this one over here. So in the clinical arena, it has gained every time more and more the concept that BMI should not be used, but should be used uh, intra-abdominal um, adipose tissue, uh, adiposity, because here it's clear that the waist circumference is clear that you're not fitted. So if it's above 102 centimeters in men, that means you are overweight. And if it's above 88 in female, that means you're overweight. And it's been an important study in where there has been a very nice correlation about the centimeters of this waist circumference and the intra-abdominal uh, presence of adipose tissue. There's a nice study here, the HOPE study, in which the presence of this abdominal tissue was clearly associated with an increased, death, uh, uh, increased uh, risk of cardiovascular death, of myocardial infarction, and overall causes of death. So we are talking about the problem that you will really routinely see in your, in your, in your patients or your studies. So, but obesity, no, no, look at all the deleterious effect that has in the lungs, in the landed gynecology, in the, in the bones, and do not forget the one related to cardiovascular disease, because there is a clear association between gaining weight and the risk to suffer uh, cardiovascular death. But not only cardiovascular death, because if you're lucky enough and you don't suffer an event, it's clear that your life expectancy can be shortened. Look here, if we take a body mass index of around 30, that means you're just overweight obesity type 1, and you are around 20, 30 years old here, you have lost already two years of, of your life just because you have that weight. And what are the, what are the problems with gaining weight and having more adipose tissue? Because per se, adipose tissue is a source of energy. So there is all the equipment of adipose adipocytes just in case uh, you don't have food and they get released to give you energy or you cannot eat for 12 hours or you have them being released and give you energy. But in addition, during the last 15 years, it has become more evident that there is a, they are an important source of, look at this, of le leptins, resistant, which are um, proteins involved in uh, enhancing the thrombotic process. It also, again, it has PI1. Do you remember PI1, the inhibitor of the fibrinolytic system? It also releases all these inflammatory mediators. So again, it per perpetuates the inflammatory milieu already present with patients with cardiovascular risk factors and atherosclerosis. And all these leads to an increase in the thrombotic risk. As you can see here in the physiological conditions, there is this fatty tissue is not inflammatory tissue. This is a healthy tissue and just a source of energy. There is not enough. I have to keep it over there. And there is no release of inflammatory mediators. There is no release of these proteins that induce thrombosis. So it's no inflammation, no thrombosis. Keep lean. But what happens if you are obese? Then all these uh, adipocytes are a source of inflammatory mediators and they recruit more inflammatory cells over there that not only induce further endothelial damage and allows the endothelium not to cover and protect against the presence of events, but also secrete all this amount of proteins which induce platelet activation. They also release tissue factor and different factors of the coagulation cascade inducing a hypercoagulability state. And finally, remember another important source of PI1, so the fibrinolytic still impaired. So where in your new month to model uh, situation in, where, in which there will be a thrombotic event, you have to take into account, will it be obese, will not be obese, will it have hypertension, because all these parameters will certainly uh, change your modulation. Just so, just to summarize and understand, I would like to just take home messages. First one related to atherosclerosis. It's very important uh, to have in mind that it's mainly associated to vascular region with bifurcations, so it makes no sense to, to evaluate thrombosis in the aorta. Better to do it in the branch, in the, the carotid, in the coronary arteries. So where there is disturbances of this flow that induces uh, damage in endothelial layers, and this damage of the endothelial layer allows lipids to entry and the development of the vascular artery lesion. Second conclusion would be uh, atherosclerosis is due to this lipid accumulation in the intima of the vessels and the recruitment of these inflammatory cells that in the first stage is protective in order to prevent the development of atherosclerosis. 
but the continuous exposure of a decade of too high levels of LDL just overwhelm this protective system and becomes uh, deleterious. And third, uh, plaque, erythrosclerotic plaque, indeed, may, may rupture, usually they rupture, but do not forget that if they erode, the likelihood to be a total occlusion over there is really high, it was almost 80%. And what about thrombosis? Uh, thrombosis results from the interaction of platelets with coagulation cascade. This is very important. Both have to be combined and both have to be considered. You cannot emit platelets if you're looking to thrombosis and you cannot emit coagulation. Second, that um, platelets not only are involved in thrombus formation, but the acti their activation also release uh, hundreds of mediators, inflammatory mediators, that will potentiate the growth of the plaque and also the recruitment of further inflammatory cells. And that in the pathological conditions, the ferrinolytic system, if you want to take it into account, is not working properly. In fact, it's not working at all. And that is why the well, thrombus do not dissolve. And finally, that the presence of comorbidities enhance all this risk of thrombosis because first, induces endothelial dysfunction, activates platelets, they're more reactive, more angrier. Third, they impair fibrinolytic, fibrinolysis, and finally, act enhances activation of the coagulation cascade. So, said that, I would like to just thank you all for your attention, and I will be more than glad to take any questions, and have a wonderful stay in Barcelona. Thank you very much for this comprehensive overview. So, I think it's already clear, and you nicely showed it, that when you want to study vascular function, you need to combine everything. Eh? It goes from structure, damage to structure, related to flows, know everything about the biology, see at the, the factors that will enhance thrombosis or will take it away and things like that. So it's a very delicate balance. As you also say, it's like between physiology and pathology. And these are the things which are quite important. Eh? So, so things are always not as simple as you would try to hope them to yeah, be as an engineer, for example, in order yeah. to do the modeling. They are not only three, four factors, no. No, exactly, not. exactly. Maybe just first a, a, a general question also for this type of public is like, when you look at this research field, what's the thing which is now important? Do we need more molecular biology? Do we need to know more about the physics behind it? Or what is missing in order to solve some of the problems? Or do we just need to get better drugs? Um, I think that y you cannot get better drugs if you don't get a, a better knowledge of what's happening. And all, all this history, I it's known from experimental models which are far away from reality, to be honest. And also from post-mortem analysis, because and that's, that imagine what has happened post-mortem. So I think that it's really important to combine mod the modeling with the in vivo scenario, because I think it could be the most closest to, to the discover, at least to the testing, of antiplatelet drugs. Because when we, when we test antiplatelet, we have tested many antiplatelet drugs now, and we have used ex vivo perfusion chambers, and they, they can give you a scenario of what's happening, but uh, it's, it's not reality, it's just the vessel within the chamber and it's supposed to flow in blood. Perhaps with, with the modeling, you have the chance to really take into account for the, for the components like hematocrit, red blood cells, like how the, uh, the flow can disturb, how can the plaque get rupture? Because I have exposed you that the plaque gets rupture and the plaque gets erode. But you know what? It remains unknown how this happens. Nobody knows how this breaks and how this erodes. And perhaps if here we combine the, the modeling processes and just know, look, if you reach this force, if you reach this strength, then the plaque cannot resist anymore. And this only, I think, modeling can, can reach it, to be honest. When you, when you look at it, it's like, is this a research field? Or when you go to the clinic, what's important? Do the cardiologists just need to know what's the size of the vessel and depending on that treat? Or how do you link these things? How do you do translate not only from the basics to the engineering, but to the clinic? And how do you... All these concepts are, are important just to have in mind what you, what, what you have to address. So when you go to the clinics, uh, th what, what the, the clinicians really want to know is, is the vulnerability of the patient. Is how are they platelets? Will they get activated soon? Are their coagulation system, how is it? The fibrinolytic system. Because they, don't kn they do not know all these all this basic components. They just measured uh, uh, different factors on the line. And if they have pi levels, they have so pi levels, no fibrinolysis. They have fibrin products, there's going fibrinolysis and so forth. And they measure the function of the platelets and they say, oh, they need more antiplatelet agents. 
but perhaps it's not a matter of antiplatelet agents, it's because they have not taken into account that the patient is obese, and perhaps if they treat first obesity, they will not need to enhance antiplatelet agents, and they perhaps they have to put combined all these concepts together in order just to find the perfect target. In fact, um, there are many, every, every year you go to European Society of Cardiology and different guidelines go out. So there's no consensus which is the right drug to use. And all drugs have um, drawbacks because uh, I, I told you there was a war between the factor two and factor 10 inhibitors for the coagulation cascade. And it's just because once you give them orally, but give more bleedings, the other ones you give less cutaneously, so every, every single day the person has to put it itself, but it does not give bleeding. So there are so many parameters to take into account that this, perhaps thanks to this, is what keeps research going on. And, but there is, when you look at the pipeline of antiplatelet and anticoagulant agents, it's empty. It's completely empty. So unless uh, we keep on doing research and we find new targets within the following five years, all drugs will become generic, which is a disaster for most of the industry, and also a disaster for the researchers because they, they invest a lot of money in doing research, let's be, let's be honest. But uh, we need to find new targets. And to find new targets, we need to know how things happen. And to come back to modeling, where would you start, or what would be, for example, that you say, like, you have a student coming to you interested in doing modeling. Do you want to go to the basic, the kind of the, the, the molecular part or more to the cellular part? Or do you say like, no, no, let's go to the patient because in the end it's the patient which is the most important? I, I would go to the, to the cellular part, not to the molecular part. The molecular, the molecular part is more for the discovery, not rather than for treating. And I think that from a modeling point of view is important to, to treat properly the patient. So I would go to the cellular part and take into account viscosity of the blood is dependent of red blood cells, of hematocrit, of uh, the share rate, of the platelet numbers, what happens if it's low, there is there less thrombus than being high. And uh, one is this, and the other one uh, will be also integrated into the modeling or the coagulation cascade. It's really important if you can model what happens if you increase the concentration of different factors, uh, what happens to the resulting modeling in the susceptibility form of thrombi. One of the things you also mentioned on forehand is like when you look at vascular problems, you see it's cardiovascular, neurovascular, peripheral, vasculature. Are they separate entities? Are they combined? Do they come together? When do you study which one? Uh, the truth is that they're, they're not as combined as we would wish. So, because when you talk about stroke, it's true that you have ischemic stroke, but it's not most often. You have the hemorrhagic stroke, which has nothing to do with this. There is a breakdown of the vessel. So usually when you dedicate yourself to cerebrovascular disease, then you just focus on what's happening over there. That if the heart is difficult, cerebrovascular is it's even worse. So it's really tough to get in there. You don't have the images, vessels are very small, and you don't know what happens. It's not exactly clear what is the function of the risk factors in the presence of, of stroke, and neither the impact of different antiplatelet agents, because most of them have failed in demonstrating to them a benefit. So why? because probably ischemic stroke or stroke due to thrombosis occlusion is not that often and usually cause hemorrhagic stroke. And as for peripheral artery disease, um, nowadays it's, is, it's easily treatable. So you can, with a flow doppler or whatever, you can just know where the thrombi is and just perform a surgery and take it out without other um, a secondary effect that having had a pain in the, in the leg. So. And, and when you want to look at vessel properties, for example, in an individual patient. For example, if you would study cardiovascular diseases to get coronary uh, properties, it's rather difficult. If you would do peripheral yes. arteries, if it you would study their properties, right. how much do you think you can translate not measurements that you would do peripherally to? N not much, not much, because um, just, to, just to put in an example, when you, the share rate that occurs in the coronary arteries, which makes them break, the same share rate in the carotid arteries do nothing. So when you, use, when you study a special location, you have to study the special conditions which make the plaque prone to rupture. So if you study this 700, 1700, 3500 seconds minus one in the coronary arteries, don't apply that for the carotid artery because it will not work, even less to peripheral artery disease. 
So you have to be cautious. And do you have any idea why that is? Because as an engineer, no. you would say you have no, shear, no, shear no. stresses in a certain vessel, no. but you do the same thing every time, no? It what it are we missing? It's, it's, it's there are two potential hypotheses. One is that the structure of the carotid artery, since it receives the pulse of, of the body, if you, if, you, if you take into account, it's not the same, the coronary artery, that is just nourishing the heart, not the carotid artery that you're receiving, you can notice yourself. So this has made all the vessel structure more, 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 um, more harder, yes, with a different composition of sessile aromatic components. This is the first reason why they say it's not that easy to break, because it's, it's able to challenge all the differences in the share rates and blood velocities compared to the coronary artery. This is the first one. And, and the second one is just that not, uh, the composition of inflammatory recruitment of the cells to the different zones of arise. And it's just a matter of debate and a matter of investigation of whether it happens. So it's a target for modeling. It's a target, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Thank you for the presentation, beautiful. The pleasure. And um, what is the role of personalized medicine in this? Uh, so what the genetic background of the... Uh Very good question indeed, because this, this is where modeling has, has play. Because when you went to, uh, the, the goal of personalized medicine is just taking into consideration all the factors that makes that person different. And in the clinics, we cannot. We can just say it has a platelet function below three, it has an event, no further events, and, th and that's it. But we're not tricking properly because we are not taking into account how the coagulation system is w working. Uh, how is it risk? Because you, you can image all the atherosclerotic plaques and just make a picture of the burden of how susceptible, susceptible is this patient to suffer an event. And with modeling, you can include all these conditions and just make like a score of what is the risk of this patient to suffer another event. And this only can ma be made through modeling. So only through modeling, we will definitely reach personalized medicine. If no, there is no way, because it's too, it's too, it's too cost effective. It, it will be too expensive to take one by one and make all the battery of assays we need to measure, the five liter system, the coagulation factors, the platelets, all the presence of factors, factors, if the endothelial layer is working, all that will be okay. This patient is 100,000 euros. Okay, give it away. We we'll leave it personalized medicine. With computer modeling, you can say, well, it has all, we can make a score. With all these factors, the likelihood to happen is this. I would treat it with this. And this, I think that, in fact, Horizon 2020 is very interested in, in reaches this goal, and which, which should be the aim of all of you, which is mine also. Maybe just to uh, pick in on, on this one, there's more and more debate in general in medicine about the link of genotype phenotype. While in the past, People would say like, oh, if we can sequence the whole genome of an individual patient, yeah. we know everything that's going on. Now, in different fields, it's clear that maybe it's no. more subtle. Yes. How is it in this field? No, no, it's the same. I mean, the, the genome, the Y genome, the general human genome was discovered. That was a real breakthrough and everybody had, you know, they had discovered uh, the entire solution to cover to solve cardiovascular disease. And that's very far from that because it's, it's nothing to do. There have been many, many genetic studies to study the genome and the association of the risk. And, th and that's it. it all, all results are null. And they have spent thousands and thousands of billions of dollars doing that. And the, the phenotype, things you're exposed to, it doesn't matter how you're born, but how you've developed is the other main features in, in suffering from an event. So what do we do with genetic information? Just genetic information. Get it? Or? No, no, because genetic information is good for this that kind of pathologies. For instance, familial hypercholesterolemia, in which there are families that already, when they are born, they have 300, 350 milligrams deciliter of cholesterol. And here, genetics too has a paper, because genetics there is the one that's determining that there is a receptor of lipids that's not working well. That's why lipids are so high. What can, how can we target this, this gene? This, in, this is in a scenario. Other scenarios in which we have hemophilias, we have the absence of factors, coagulation factors, or we have the absence of, of platelet, num very low number of platelets. What do we do? Can it die by hemorrhage? So all the inherited disorders do have an important role in genetics, but not as we look thrombosis as a whole as a as pathological problem that's really threatening all the population. And how do you think these genetic abnormalities can be used, for example, also to start the research or start the modeling? Is that, that a place? It, it is enter? a place, definitely a place. 
because not only what happens if this factor in, in factor five laden, if, if in the, um, there's a disease that some factors are missing, coagulation factors are missing, but by modeling you can say what happens if we put the factor in, what factor we take the factor out, but we cover with other factors. So this can only be done modeling because uh, not only when doing experimental model models with animals that I work with, this is expensive, but it all you also have many ethical boundaries that you cannot overcome. So with modeling, you don't have this, this issue. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have two questions. The first one is related to uh, the turbulence of the flow in the vessels. Uh, you said that the pathway activates more when you have uh, separation of, of vessels. Uh, when you have rigidi rigidification of the vessels due to, I don't know, uh, yeah. age, uh, yeah. does it, so, so ma even in, in straight vessels you could have. And the second uh, question is related to the difference in um, the size of the vessels. Uh, for example, uh, when you have very small vessels, uh, the red blood cells change shape and you have different behaviors. Does the pathway change here or is it the same, no matter, uh, for, for a modeling point of view, could you model the same? Uh, the parameters di are different, for example, for the shear rates, but yes. are the pathways the same? Yeah. Um, uh, let's start in the first one that was uh, the turbulence and the rigidity of the vessel. The thing is that uh, what happens with, with the rigidity of the vessel is that it is cannot compensate for changes. And this is very important since it cannot compensate for changes. There is a likelihood that uh, cellular elements of the blood get stuck there and since they get stuck there more easily from thrombi. So indeed, um, if you have a very high rigidity, not only the endothelial layer for sure is dysfunctional because, because it has disappeared all the capacity to compensate, but also it cannot adapt to flow conditions. And, there, um, and then cellular elements that should not be interacting one to each other do so. So we do, it, it is an increased risk of suffering thrombosis. And as for the red blood cells, you, you made a very important point, which is under low flow conditions, what happens to the red blood cells is that they get deformed. And when they deform themselves, they are more prone to get attached one to another, to change the viscosity of the blood, and to uh, challenge platelets uh, to get one close to the other one. And then a clear example is the case for vein thrombosis, because we have talking all the time, I've been talking about arterial thrombosis, in which platelets are the main component. But if you, if you go to, to venous thrombosis, the, the major component is the red blood cell. Why? Because it has become, you have uh, the, the vessel, blood vessels, that uh, the, the, the valves do not work properly, or they, and they work slowlier, that makes the, the flow rate goes down, and all the red blood cells get deformed and help platelets to get in contact with the coagulation cascade and activate the coagulation cascade. So while in the arterial tree, high share rate, platelets get activated, a thrombus forms, in the venous tree is the opposite, is the lower the share rate the more prone to form thrombus formation. And I'm very glad you brought this question out because you also have to distinguish if you want to emulate venous thrombosis in, in which stasis and the coagulation cascade are the most important factors or arterial thrombosis in which a high flow rate and platelets are the most important factors. Partially related to this also something you just briefly mentioned with nitric oxide and things like that is like vasoreactivity. How important is vasoreactivity in all this story? It's, it's crucial, the vasoreactivity. It's just, it's true, I just went through it very fast and, did just, and didn't point out how important it is because while you have vasoreactivity and the vessel is able to adapt to any situation, that works fine, the system works. So it's something you have to take into account. I don't know if in modeling it's you're able to, to take into account how you can compensate for these uh, movements or, or not, but it seems Theoretically, challenging. if we know what to model, we could model. Okay. But it's a combination <laughs> of first knowing and then <laughs> being able to. But uh, that would be wonderful because then if you can put this, um, take into account this when you model that, that then would be very, very close to reality, which is the most important of the modeling part. 
but partially you already mentioned like when it's normal and vasoreactivity is normal then things are compensated but yes. very often you have like a lack of vasoreactivity so the question is then also like maybe we can simplify the models by just leaving it out if we want to model disease yes or do you still no 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 you're, you're right if you would just time? want to model disease then you just leave it out of the equation okay thank you there was a question here First, uh, very nice presentation, and another thing is that the uh, obesity numbers are quite scary. <laughs> but I would like to question to uh, yes to ask if uh, do you think stem cell therapies uh, would play a role in uh, treatment of atherosclerosis? Okay, you said the stem cell therapies. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, stem cell therapy is very very hot nowadays, and we are studying cell cell therapies over there in the in the lab. But we are addressing more its use to, to once the heart has infarcted in order to recover the heart. Because stem cells numbers in the, in the, in the stream, in the bloodstream, it's extremely low. So when you just find one out of mm, one, 1,000 million, you say it doesn't, have a, it doesn't have nothing to do here. So numbers are so small in the circulation of stem cells that unless you, you challenge they release from the bone marrow by secreting, by, by infusing some growth factors or whatever that I induce their release and perhaps then you find more in the flowing blood, I would not consider them at all. Particularly because if there is, they are extremely low under a healthy patient when it's diseased, it's even lower. So if you're lucky, you find one. If not, you don't find anyone. That's why in, in, in cardiovascular research, we are using them to repair the heart. But what we do is that we obtain them and then we isolate them, we expand them, we get 6,000, we, we get a million, and then we inject them. But we have manipulated stem cells. We have not allowed them to just flow as physiological would be or pathological would be. Talking about cell, uh, cells and stem cells also, it's like what you say, a lot of the things start with endothelial damage. But from what you say and when you look at the drugs, they don't seem to directly address the endothelium. Uh, what, what's, is there a reason behind yeah, it? Yeah, because or? it's too late. <laughs> the, the thing is that endothelial damage has already happened and it, w it happened a few decades ago. So I'm already late. The problem is that the, the first manifestation of the disease is that the endothelium is not working well. So, and then all the procedures start. And then 20 years later, 30 years later, you have the event. So you do not address the endothelial damage because of that. But if you're, if you're doing a follow-up study, all of them include the analysis of molecules involved with endothelial function to see if an intervention, we do, th we do it, we, do d we give dietary, dietary interventions to obese people that are healthy or not under any drug. And what we do is measure endothelial function and see over two years what happens with the diet intervention. Is endothelium still working, although they are obese? So in these scenarios, it's, it's useful. In the, in the use of antiplatelet armamentarium with purposes just to uh, stop the risk of having another infarct, it's too late. Yeah. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, you seem very keen to, to modeling, uh, yeah. but I would like to uh, know your opinion, okay, what you dislike about modeling. <laughs> and also, um, in your opinion, which should be the, the key element um, that we should take into account as a, as a modeling community to integrate that technology into the clinical practice? Um, uh, I'm very keen with modeling because we have been trying to get two European grants during the last seven, eight years. And with, at the moment, no success. We have two submitted European projects at the moment. And the thing is, that's why I'm so keen on, because um, I, I really believe that it could lead us to personalized medicine. But what I hate is when you write down the, the protocol, they say, Okay, but you have to give me th this detail. And I say, no, no, I don't know this detail. Or if I knew this detail, or how many uh, factors are released by the platelets, or how many platelets would get attached, uh, definitely I, I would not be, I, I would be just looking for new, for, for to become a millionaire because I will knew everything. And the problem with modeling is that you need too many parameters which are still not known. And you keep answering, and uh, I'm running a project of biomarkers, and the thing is that by, by I, will, I will provide all the particles and microvesicles that are released in an atherosclerotic lesion, a prior atherosclerotic lesion and post-atherosclerotic lesion, and I will provide all these markers, and then they will model 
what's the risk of this plaque to rupture, combining imaging techniques and see if it has a very lipid rich core or not. And, and they always ask me, which, which are the markers I have to measure? If, say, if I knew the markers, I would just s set up a kit with um, Pfizer and say, please measure this marker and you will know the risk. So I do not know the markers. It's just you have to go by chance and put an array of markers to see which are the ones that may be released from the plaque because it's not known. It's because when you have an event, the issue is that you know it's too late. So since we're not able to know if this plaque is going or not to rupture, what I find at the site of the plaque, is it from this plaque or another one ruptured and had the event? Or perhaps it ruptured three days ago and it just, the thrombus got dislodged. So there are the too many answers that, the too many questions that have not been answered yet that cannot provide you as much as detail as I do wish. This is the only thing that it makes more difficult to, <laughs> to understand, to get, to get, to, to collaborate, just to see, I need all these parameters and I cannot give you all that. This is the only thing. And the second question, sorry, which was? Uh, the key elements to integrate uh, modeling to the clinical practice. The key elements would be uh, to take into account as much mm, factors as you can. That's why they keep asking, give me as many factors as you can because I need them all. The more reliable you make the model, for definitely, for sure, the most success it will be, and we have we, we need uh, in the in the in the clinics. We definitely need what's called uh, ready to use assays or a bedside assays that can provide you with a quick answer, which is the vulnerability of the patient. But to do that, you need you need to know to take into account, as I said many times, all the cardiovascular risk factors. How many does it have? What is the impact of every cardiovascular risk factor in transformation? how the number of platelets, the hematocrit, red blood cells, the viscosity of the blood, if it's an heparin, if it's not an heparin, was it treated, was not treated. So all these factors may definitely uh, take you to the proper um, treatment of the patient. It's interesting that you mentioned also the saying like these biomarkers because <laughs> it's one of the other, to me, slightly disappointing fields of research that a huge <laughs> amount of money went in trying to find like the holy grail yeah. one biomarker that for a specific disease would tell you everything but i think by it's clear by now that this is not the way that it works no it's like just one biomarker would not help too much so what's the role of biomarkers you think the, the role of biomarkers first of all it's a, it's a pretty new story so we still have to have faith in it stem cells have already running for 15 years so we can now have be more um, aseptic. But with biomarkers, it's, it's a newer field, and the thing is that they, they try to, since, since they don't take into account modeling, there is no, at the moment we cannot model anything, then let's find the particle that tell us if, if something has happened. And again, with whom? With a patient that has had 30 years of disease, he's obese, hypertensive, it has been taken statins 20 years. That's why it has not been successful, because there may too many confounding factors to read a biomarker. And the biomarker is just a molecule that is found in blood and can give you diagnostic of how the patient is. So let's call the biomarker, could be the readout of PI-1. But since PI-1 is increased in obesity, is increased in inflammation, it's not a good biomarker because it's increased in everybody. So the thing is to find one protein that gives you a hint of what that patient, that patient that has suffered from an event uh, is, is susceptible to have another event. And so since many of them are redundant and most of them are present in all the pathways, pathological pathways, that's why it has not been success. And probably because we do not need to look for one biomarker, but we need to look for a panel of biomarkers, which are indeed only expressed in those situations in which the patient is susceptible to again follow up, suffer another thrombotic. So it's integration of information. Integration which is the of information. Most important. There was a question there? Thank you. A uh, question that is not so related to modeling, or maybe it's also relevant, but I'm curious. You mentioned something about the, um, that women are more susceptible to atherosclerosis, and also, could you please comment on that, and also the effect of contraception, because okay. everybody Very knows good. that, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the truth is that I, I had one hour and a half, I didn't use all my time, and it's that, that why are good questions, because you follow the talk. The thing is that women die more of cardiovascular disease, but are less susceptible to atherosclerosis. So the thing is that there is the women reach an age where they reach the menopause in which there are no estrogens. And the lack of estrogens uh, lead to endothelial dysfunction. 
lead platelets to aggregate and to a dysfunction in the coagulation pathway. So under 50, 54, the women is much more protected than men against suffering any cardiovascular event. But then, since estrogens disappear, not only they lose their protective effect, but uh, they lose a complete protective effect and they not get neutral, they get the opposite because the, 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 mm, the human body reacts as something was missing. And if something misses, then they in increases the risk. And that's why they die more than men. But if we, we, if we analyze the deaths of cardiovascular deaths of women, men over, over the decades, you would see that the 40 years, women is much, much more protective because of the presence of, of estrogens. In line with this, the use of uh, contraconceptives or is, is not an issue because what only does is that changes the levels of some of them to make sure you're not in a fertile moment. But the concentrations of uh, when you are reach the menopause, estrogens completely disappear. Here is that uh, they work with the progesterone levels in order to avoid that you get uh, pregnant, but they do not abolish your estrogens, which is quite different. If we go to the pre perimenopausal uh, um, issue, there it's very important to have them because they also uh, help to stimulate estrogen production. And it's seen, multiple studies have seen that while the use of contraconceptives after the perimenopausal uh, years is dangerous, while you're having the perimenopausal, it's very beneficial because they allow your estrogens to keep balanced and to keep steady for two, three years more. Okay, thank you very much for this very interesting talk and very stimulating discussion, oh, I thank think. You, thank I you, thank you. I hope it created a lot of ideas in everybody on what to do next. So thanks again, and now it's coffee time. <laughs>